Sure, thank you. Hi everyone, uh, it's really wonderful to see so many familiar faces here, but also meet new people and to kind of realize that you're not just Twitter bot, Rod, I'm looking at you. Um, so for those of you who know my work, uh, you probably know that kind of my professional career is very much intertwined with this whole uh, non-national justice argument. And I was in fact once invited to a journal's editorial board so I could yell at people for using natural disasters misnomer. Um, I'm hoping I won't be doing any yelling today. You know, we seem to be all on the same page. And, and I very often get asked, you know, kind of why, why do you care? Um, you know, what is this about removing natural from this discourse of, of, of disasters? Isn't it just the semantics? Um, I think semantics is going to be the second most used word today after disaster. So there we go, unexpected. Um, anyhow, so even before the uh, No Natural Disasters campaign started, uh, my friend and former comrade uh, Jason Monmedin, who's coming um, on later today at 1.30, or two o'clock in the afternoon, um, we, we were getting quite a lot of similar reactions from people, right? Like, well, why do you guys care? You know, go do something useful with your lives. Um, but then um, we got a lot of positive response and support when we were doing a corridor activism at the 2017 uh, Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction. I have lots of stories, but you know, these are for after, for, for social events. Um, and this was one of the reasons why we actually started the Disaster Deconstructed podcast, right? Because we really wanted to explain um, why this isn't just about semantics and there is much more to it. And that more is about power, it's about ideology, uh, as well as oppression and exploitation. And we are not the first people to talk about it. You know, Terry already mentioned Voltaire and Rousseau, and I'm sure you're all familiar with all the work that has been published. Um, since the 1970s, and I can literally spend the next 10 minutes just listing people, of, uh, names of people, right, who have been saying that disaster is not natural, um, but count yourself lucky, I won't do that. Uh, instead, I am actually going to talk about the following. Does the expression nat natural disasters undermine the efforts of disaster risk reduction and instead uh, enhances uh, disaster risk creation? And in my opinion, it does. It does enhance disaster risk creation. Um, and the downsides of using the misnomer natural disasters are multifaceted. Um, it serves up um, as a kind of as a narrative that prioritizes the story of a hazard and destruction, the story of death, the story of loss, um, over the discourse of power, class, uh, inequity, and marginalization. It also, of course, serves up the interests of the powerful because it is a symbolic tool um, and it signifies that whilst you know we might like to prevent disaster impacts that we might like to prevent um, losses right we are after all at the mercy of nature right well, what, what what can we do and so this kind of narrative externalizes the threat makes it uh, and making it kind of beyond the human dimension um, and this allows the celebration of you know, man's dominion uh, over nature, and also it maintains the power structures that might be um, otherwise threatened by examination um, of the way that the dominant socioeconomic system, i.e. capitalism, uh, creates risks. And so the expression natural disaster, um, as already been mentioned earlier today um, um, by, by a few speakers, um, it often employed by those who um, are advocating for technical and market-based uh, solutions. And this is further reinforced by policymakers and of course the media, right? The kind of the, the headlines that we see pretty much every day. Um, and this fits so well with the capitalist-driven disaster industry. Um, because seeing disasters as natural means that nature is dangerous, but can nevertheless be managed. And when it cannot be managed, well, we can put the blame on nature. This is just so convenient. And such position reinforces the status quo, um, kind of, you know, completely avoiding responsibility uh, for failures of development uh, or maldevelopment um, by blaming nature. Um, and kind of as Jason and I um, have been developing this work, um, quite a few people, academics, um, argued saying that natural disaster is just a convenience term, you know, forget about it. Um, and, but we didn't think so. Um, and so we decided to prove it. You know, we don't give up easily. Um, and we started discussions with linguists and um, psychologists. And Jason will be talking about our work with linguists later on today. So stay out for that, it'll be fun. 
Um, Jason and I teamed up um, with Colin Tucker Smith, uh, Marjorie Prokoch, and Victoria Colvin at the University of Florida, all of whom are psychologists. And we carried out a uh, project implicit that basically allowed us to understand better the correlation um, between social attitudes and the belief whether disasters are natural um, or not. And we have taken the harm scale and the blame scale uh, to study the difference between disaster and natural disaster, right? So how kind of people react to that. And what we measured is political orientation, uh, orientation on social issues, uh, beliefs about disasters, and preferred ways of dealing with risks. And so what we wanted to know really in this project implicit is does the expression itself changes the result? Or kind of is it just simply a deeper ideological divide? And so far, what we see is that it's kind of a combination of both, really. Um, and we found that, for example, understanding of blame, uh, origins of risk, and preferred mitigation solutions are very strongly correlated with political ideology. We also find found that implicit attitudes um, towards the underlying causes of disasters um, are also defined by ideological differences. And, and finally, we found that understanding disasters as natural um, correlates with technocratic solutions. And this work is ongoing, and we, we, we really hope uh, we will be able to share more soon, and uh, the paper has literally just been submitted. Um, and we've been doing quite a lot of other work in this space, and as I said, Jason will talk particularly about our translation work uh, later today. It has never been our intention to police the language, right? Like we are very often accused of. Instead, we hoped um, that we hope to kind of highlight the understanding of implications of using the misnomer. And we hope that this will change the uh, way we frame our narratives about disasters. Current narratives about disasters are, you know, disasters kind of unexpected, disasters as shocks, disasters as natural. It creates the illusion that seems real. And this is what Yurchak refers to as hypernormalization, where it is the story and not the reality that matters. And then the story that is narrated through the lens of natural disaster um, is the story of neoliberal resilience. It is the story of successful recovery, of going back to normal, of kind of living happily ever after. But we know that this kind of story ends well only in fairy tales and only for very, very few. Um, in reality, resilience building and kind of its best body building by better, my favorite blog of all times, um, they're simply reconstructing the risks and recreating and sometimes enhancing inequalities um, that eventually lead to yet another disaster. And my comrade West Chief, who is there at the back of the room, and I, uh, we, we spend a lot of time writing about this over, over, over the pandemic. So if, if you're interested, um, you know. Go chat to well. <laughs> he loves talking about it. Um, for the marginalized, um, disaster is not a new or a sudden or kind of unexpected danger. Um, it is a continuation of everyday harm uh, inflicted on those relegated to the margins of society. Disasters do not simply bring about suffering, they expose suffering. And framing disasters as natural allows for capitalist exploitation to thrive and increase this suffering. Capitalism needs suffering, it wouldn't exist otherwise. And then blame it on nature. And so in order to contribute to this uh, shift in thinking and discourse, we need to be much more deliberate and measured in how we um, use the words that we use. And um, what is often simply kind of lack of clarity, you know, or just or care um, and or consistent language even, actually fuels the cycle of misinformation. And we must push back against short-term profit-oriented or headline-grabbing thinking. And so language, and most importantly, how we frame what we say, really, really matters. Um, many of us are getting together to talk, write, um, you know, think, challenge, explain, educate, and learn. Um, but most importantly, to encourage the dialogue that would lead uh, to reframing of disasters. But also not forgetting that disasters is not a universal concept, uh, which, of course, Jeshi Gayar um, explored so fantastically in his latest book, The Invention of Disasters. 
Um, you know, if you haven't read it yet, please, please go read it. Um, and I believe that um, a much more affordable soft uh, cover version is coming up soon. And I promise you, he hasn't paid me for, for this plugin, you know, <laughs> so go, go and check out his book. And anyhow, um, when we speak about disasters, we need not to be dogmatic. Uh, instead, we need to talk about the systemic root uh, causes of disasters that are grounded in oppression and marginalization, imperialism and colonization, capitalism and patriarchy. What we say and do when it comes to disasters should be about ethics, equity, power, and responsibility, and not about hazards or nature. Thank you so much.